The Dyatlov Pass incident was an event in which nine Soviet hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1 and 2, 1959, in uncertain circumstances. The experienced trekking group from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, led by Igor Dyatlov, had established a camp on the eastern slopes of Kolot Sayakal in the mountains of the Soviet Union. Overnight, something caused them to cut their way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six of them had died from hypothermia while the other three had been killed by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of these four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face, two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. The investigation concluded that a compelling natural force had caused the deaths. There are many theories that try to explain the Dyatlov Pass incident, from aliens, to a military operation to something completely unnatural. One of the explanations suggests that it was a case of carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is extremely harmful on the human body, because it bonds with hemoglobin better than oxygen does, so if you breathe in carbon monoxide, your blood is more likely to pick up the carbon monoxide than it is the oxygen. Someone exposed to carbon monoxide suffers from headaches, dizziness, nausea, confusion, loss of judgment, and in acute poisoning cases, someone may suffer loss of motor function, difficulty with higher intelligence functions, dementia, and eventually death. How did the Dyatlov Pass victims suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning? It has everything to do with the tent. The tent was actually two small tents sewn together to create one large tent, intended to fit ten people, the group originally had ten people, but one person turned back at the beginning of the trip due to an injury. It was extremely heavy and the group took turns carrying it. With Siberia often reaching sub-zero temperatures, a small wood stove was brought to heat the tent. On February 1st, the group set out to end their expedition. From diary records, we know they intended to cross through the mountain pass and make camp on the other side, but with weather conditions deteriorating into a full-on snowstorm, the group lost their way and was forced to stop and make camp to wait out the storm. In the midst of a blizzard, the group hastily erected their tent, cutting corners and using their skis and ski poles as tent poles. They set up the wood stove and settled in for the night. Wood stoves produce carbon monoxide. That's one of the reasons they need a vent for the smoke and fumes to leave through. The wood stoves that were designed for Soviet tents had a long tube that led out of the tent and expelled the smoke and fumes outside. But at the end, the tube turns upwards. Isn't it possible that snow might have gotten into the tube and melted into water, blocking the carbon monoxide from escaping through the vent? On top of this, since the tent was 100% bigger than the types of tents the wood stove was designed to heat, the hikers would have used more wood and had a bigger flame going than if they hadn't sewn the two tents together, creating more carbon monoxide. If this happened, the carbon monoxide created from the burning wood stove would have accumulated inside the tent, where the nine hikers slept. They would have woken up hours later, dizzy and confused and disoriented. They might have had no idea where they were or what was happening, just that they were trapped in the tent. Their fine motor skills would have been gone, so they used knives to cut the tent walls from the inside to escape, and they left the tent only partially dressed and without their shoes. Hikers in cold climates tend to sleep with most of their clothing still on, aside from their shoes, for warmth, so it's plausible that even in their disoriented state, they were still partially dressed. Confused and perhaps scared, they began walking into the woods. They made it nearly a kilometer away when disaster struck. Four of the hikers fell into a hidden ravine. They didn't die right away, two of the hikers were found wearing clothing items belonging to the other two hikers, suggesting that two died fairly quickly and the other two took clothing pieces from the dead in an attempt to keep warm. Still confused and disoriented from the gas poisoning, but possibly more lucid than before after being exposed to fresh, clean oxygen, the other five turned back, probably intending to go back to the tent. During the walk back, three of the hikers fell and succumbed to the hypothermia and gas poisoning. The last two made it almost back to the tent, but it is theorized that they couldn't find it either because it was snowing again and visibility was low, or because it was nighttime. 
There is evidence that suggests that one of these last two hikers climbed the tree, most likely to look for the campsite. Unable to find it, and with the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning possibly wearing off, the last two hikers built a small fire and huddled near it for warmth. The fire wasn't enough. They suffered from frostbite and hypothermia, and one of the last stages of hypothermia is the body unrestricts all of the blood vessels in the extremities in a last-ditch effort to warm up the body with blood, creating a feeling of overheating. This leads to something called paradoxical undressing, meaning the victim removes their clothing because they think they're overheating, when in actuality, they're freezing to death. They died next to the burnt-out campfire, wearing nothing but underclothes. Other theories include avalanche, murder by native peoples, or testing of some sort of top-secret Soviet weapons. There are even those out there who believe aliens killed them. Carbon monoxide poisoning, in my opinion, fits all of the evidence and is very plausible. Unfortunately, the Russian government still has not released many documents on the incident, and likely never will, so there could be more evidence locked up somewhere that gives a whole new perspective on the incident.